I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Terry doesn't know how to do a bumper, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to record Terry doing a not a bumper, because Terry's really shitty at doing bumps for shows. He's just going to be like, oh, I'm Canadian, you should listen to him because I'm Canadian. <laughs> and he's also Canadian, so yeah, he's, he's horrible at this. Alright, let me, let me give it a try. It's your show. Yeah. Ooh, it's 4 o'clock in the fucking morning. This is Terry Safer. This is a pop now, asshole. That was the best one. Yeah, that was the best one. This is Terry Safer. This is a pop now, assholes. Welcome back to another episode. Our next guest for the next episode is going to be Terry Sacre. He's a friend of mine. He's a fellow Canadian. I think you'll enjoy that. I'll be upfront with you. This episode is probably going to bother some people. It's going to be sensitive material in some ways. Something that I think that we should talk more about. And our guest is somebody I think you'll find fascinating personal life experience, the books that she's written, which I encourage people to read. It's about how men and women treat one another and think about one another, and more importantly, how we treat uh, the ideas about family and our kids. Um, I want to thank Aaron Pizzi for coming out and having this conversation. Even if you don't agree with us, that's fine. If you want to leave comments to the opposite opinion or a different opinion, that's fine. And I hope that you at least listen through and consider what she has to say. And if you do turn it off, well, well, I guess that's your choice. I'm not going to hold it against you. And I'll see you on the next episode. But for now, stay tuned. This is Smashlock and Mr. Dragonbeard from Apostasy Now. If you have any questions or comments or would like to be a guest on our show, contact Mr. Dragonbeard at... You can reach us at the WordPress page we have set up for apostasynow.net. Leave a comment there. You can also reach us through my Twitter, at... Mr. Dragonbeard, all lowercase, or even better yet, leave a comment or some type of a post uh, to get in contact with us over on Facebook. Uh, we have a page, Apostasy Now Podcast. Everyone's welcome. Leaving us with the Phantom. Can you please not call him that? It just, it sounds silly. Sillier than the arsonist, which starts with arse? Because I'm very much a skeptic, more, I'm, I'm more of a skeptic than I am an atheist. I mean, atheist is a conclusion based on my skepticism. You'll have to come like a little child to the foot of the cross. That attitude is what is responsible for the rise of atheism. That's not what Islam is all about. Islam is peace. What is the penalty for leaving the Muslim faith? With a death penalty. Thank you. This is Apostasy Now. For people to get the information correct before they start yap, yap, yapping. Get ready to root for the bad guys. Because with the evidence, the only evidence. Aaron Pizzi. I've listened to you a few times uh, on podcasts, usually through AVFM, mm-hmm. but yeah. I've, seen, I've seen some stuff on YouTube as well. Probably the best way to start it off is just to ask you. Um, I have a lot of listeners, I think, that are younger than I am. I'm 37. And for myself, I've grown up in a world where there's always been shelters, you know, yeah. women's shelters, et cetera. Um, you were involved back in the day in getting that set up, if I understand correctly, back in England, right? Yeah, it was 1971. I'm 75 now. I was 30-something. I opened, it, actually, a community center for mothers and children. Uh, and uh, because I act- ended up having furious rows with the emerging women's movement, who, as far as I was concerned, were busy preaching that marriage was a dangerous place for women and children. 
and to cut a long story short, I marched off and started what I believed, which was the community centre where women who were at home with their children could come and use their talents and bring their children. Because at that point, there was nothing. If you had children, you were isolated in your own homes. So what I hadn't expected was that a woman would come in who was horribly bruised and say, nobody will help me. And I, my mother was Canadian, incidentally. Okay. So I'm, I'm half Canadian. Huh. And, uh, well, I don't she, know. I don't know if you know, but I'm Canadian as well. So I can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she was very physically abusive to me, particularly because I looked like my father, and she hated my father. He was a monster. He was six foot four, of a raging human being who had terribly damaged by his own background. Neither of them really should have had children. She actually only wanted one son, and the poor woman had twin girls. And then she did have her son, and she didn't actually once he got to the age of seven and he was becoming you know a normal smelly little boy she dumped him in a prep school and that was it she never really paid attention to him thereafter so yes i had an awful lot of experience so when kathy came in um, i was completely even-handed i knew it wasn't a gender issue from the very beginning yeah, i knew yeah. that children born into these kind of violent families like we were the chances of repeating the patterns are huge uh, unless you're lucky enough to have help, and then you can transcend. So very quickly, the little tiny house, only four rooms, started to fill up with women, some as violent as the men they left, but all of them certainly victims of very severe physical violence, because otherwise you, I mean, at one point, to give you an idea, in these four small rooms, there were 56 mothers and children, with the children sleeping on mattresses on the floor, and the women lined up against the walls, sleeping with their heads on their knees. But it was better than going back to where they'd come well, from. Well. And then thereafter is the whole history. There is a book which you can buy in Canada. It's called on Amazon. It's called This Way to the Revolution. And it's about the whole time of the 70s when I first started the refuge movement and what happened because it was hotly contested, my attitude was hotly contested by the radical feminists and I've been embattled with them now for all these years. You know, it's nearly 50 coming up for 50 years. Yeah, that's a long time to have a battle. It's, there's, I find, different types of people that go by that term, um, assuming that you're talking about the ones who t t uh, tend to come with a chip on their shoulder, uh, hard edge. Uh, well, no, I think the thing is that all of us who, the emerging women movement, men and women, were perfectly willing as equity feminists to support the idea of equal rights for women. Yeah. And particularly in my time, you see, because certainly growing up in the 50s, I was getting married in 61, and I had to ask, um, I had to prove to my doctor I was getting married to be allowed contraception. And you had, as a woman, you couldn't sign a mortgage. You had to get your father or a man to sign a mortgage for you. Wow. And uh, if you remember in those times, abortions were illegal, and I saw two women. One died of infection. And the other was very, very ill uh, after backstreet abortions. It was a very, very hard time. So understandably, there was a great deal of anger. But what most people didn't realize is um, you had to be there in those huge collectives, which I was, to see that actually it was nothing to do with women, this women's movement. It was a Marxist movement run by women. And actually, it was very clever politically because it started in Washington when an awful lot of, of, of feminists had gone down to the south to help liberate the black communities and desegregate the schools. They came back, and there's a book that explains it all, and they agreed that they would move the goals from capitalism, which is what both men and women were fighting, and the new goal would be patriarchy, and that was all men. And from then onwards, they built a really an enormous uh, multi-million project, which is across the Western world, and it is totally biased against men, families, fathers and boys yeah so you were you know, you... more strongly than canada i might say i came over about 10 or 12 years ago with anna and cools your senator okay and we did a, a six weeks tour right the way across the canada visiting all the men's groups and it was appalling it was appalling yeah wow such so, um yeah the first time i grew up kind of with the assumption that anyone who said uh that they were uh, women's rights, that they were feminist, that would mean equality. And there's certain concepts that I was taught, you know, in school, television, and only when I hit a certain age, it's only been actually in the last few years, that I've gone from basically 
um, I think in the past I've even encouraged some women to adapt the term, like adopt the term for themselves, because I felt that they needed to be a little bit more self-assertive in life. <laughs> but I have never, um, I had never really been challenged with the more extreme views that you're talking about where it's transformed. A lot, of, a lot of people assume it means equal rights. I think that's true, because these are mostly people who are actually not on the coal face. They haven't been thrown out of their houses, barred from seeing their children, uh, false allegations, allegations of, of sexual abuse. So only when it touches people within the families, maybe a member of the family is a victim, either a man or a woman or a child, that suddenly the whole thing springs into reality. Yeah, and I think the expression that I've heard you say is that people, uh, I'm not sure how you phrase it exactly, but something to the effect of people assume that violence um, is a gender issue, but it's actually a family issue. Yes, I've always said that. It's generational. If you look at your own family, you can see, you know, I could see certainly in mine, there were three generations I could trace it back to, uh, and that would have been my great-grandparents, my, um, my grandparents who migrated on the one side, my mother's side, from Ireland, from Ireland, and then ended up in Ottawa. Portland was the village, I think, where they, they ended up. And her father was alcoholic and apparently very violent. And uh, on my father's side, the same thing. His father and his grandfather, they were all alcoholics. Mind you, the, then, uh, and his mother, he was the youngest of an Irish Catholic family of 17. And there was a lot of violence in that family. So it's, you can see in time, and because all the, when women came in, I used to do questionnaires with them, and I used to, to do three generational, to have a look, because I believed that it was generational. And it is. It's a learned pattern of behavior. And actually now, with MRI scans, they know that the fetus in the womb, the baby can be affected by domestic violence, because when you smoke a cigarette, you share it with your baby. When you take a drink, you share it with your baby. And when you experience the chemicals of rage or fear, you share those with the baby. So the baby is born wired up. Yeah. Yeah. Domestic violence is a, uh, it's, it spreads, it affects everybody. I totally agree with you. I've, uh, I don't know. I've, I think it's the, for me, the, the area that I have found the most sticky is that there is a sense that some people have that when you try to talk about what people are talking about when they use the word feminist, uh, that you're not allowed to split people up into different uh, groups and different motives. Who's, who's the people who say that? Uh, well, I'm online. I have different discussions with people, right? And even in real life, I've sat down, had discussions about it, where, you know, whereas a lot of people that I know, when they say that they're a feminist, I, you know, I can argue with them about some misconceptions they have at the core of what they've been kind of sort of taught. Mm -hmm. But their goal is to find equality. And so... That's absolutely fine. No one's arguing yeah. that. I think the question you ask, if somebody comes up and says, look, I'm a feminist, why do you object to me? I ask a simple question. I say, do you believe that we all need to fight for equality for women? Yes or no? Or do you believe that all women are innocent victims of men's violence because they are men are part of the patriarchy? If they say yes to that, then they're radical feminists. Right. Right. And uh, yeah, the, you know, the reason I think that what you have to offer when you talk about uh, these issues is that you have personal experience and you have an understanding, not just from seeing it from a distance. You've you've actually interacted with it over the years. You've watched it kind of go I from. Work, yeah, I work with both men, women and children, both yeah. victims and people who are designated as perpetrators and very often aren't. Yeah, um, yeah. And um, I'll be coming actually to Canada, hopefully, in June for a conference. So I'll be in Toronto. Oh, so nice. where, where are you? I'm a couple hours from Toronto. I'm near London, Ontario. All oh, right, yeah. yeah. So uh, so maybe we'll see you there. It's Attila Vincer who's giving the conference. And Anne Cools will be there. I'll be so pleased to see her. Oh, wow. Um, if I can figure out the date, I might be able to be there. I am a truck Six driver, so what's that? The 6th to the 8th of Six. June. Six. Well, I'll figure it out on my calendar later. Okay. <laughs> uh, my real name is Corey, by the way. Okay, Corey. Yeah. That's just in case we meet. Then you won't have to call me Mr. Dragonbeard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, know. I was wondering that. <laughs> you have a beard, by the way. Uh, yes, I do. I always, I've had a beard for uh, many years. So, yeah. Okay, well, it won't be too confusing then. Any beard <laughs> I see, I'll say, is that Cory? <laughs> Yeah, I always have children, uh, young children trying to pull it, and uh, older children asking if they can pull it. 
Um, so, but you were uh, in Canada not too long ago, if I remember correctly, uh, trying to help people organize to start shelters here for men, if I remember correctly. No, I wasn't. I was a good 12 years ago. I was with Anne Cools. Okay. Uh, I was involved with various um, things that happened, including, do you remember Earl Silverman hanged himself? Yes, I did hear about that, yes. Yeah, and there were groups trying to set up shelters for men, um, and a great feeling of guilt from an awful lot of people because nobody really expected that to happen. But then when you look at the figures for suicide among men, and to be honest with you, it's four times higher than women, and it, it very often is because they have been deprived of their families and lost everything. Right. And, you know, when I have disagreements with people, like I say, online or in person, uh, I try to make it clear that I'm not denying uh, or being insensitive that the fact that women have had an uphill battle in many ways. And in many ways, there still are injustices that can be pointed out and addressed. Uh, I, I don't try to diminish that. No, but you know, this is the human condition. Um, and yeah. It's not just women. It's also men. I was born in China and I grew up in the Middle East. And, and you live in different cultures. You yeah. recognize that we need to fight for each other. It's not... It's not a gender issue. Right. Well, and, and full disclosure, my rude awakening for a lot of stuff came through recently going through the family court system for, uh, we have, me and my now ex-wife have a, well, she was five when we separated. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I was actually stunned, uh, repeatedly about how things were going. Yeah. It just didn't seem reasonable, but all of the, um. It's not that the people in the court are unreasonable, like the judge isn't unreasonable, the lawyers aren't even unreasonable, but the system is set up in a way that they can only do certain things, and a certain process has to be followed that seems kind of crazy. But one of the problems you have to remember, uh, Canada is probably older in terms of the feminist movement than any of the other countries, because Trudeau, in his time, pumped huge sums of money into the then emerging feminist movement. So they've had a long time to get into positions of power. And most of the training of all the judiciary, all the lawyers, all the services are done by radical feminist organizations. Wow. So you, sorry, so you have this problem that people sitting there on the whole have been brainwashed into thinking that all women are innocent victims of men's violence. And so whatever you're saying, it's going through that lens. Well, it's interesting because the experience I had was that, well, starting with... Um... Uh, well, I had the night that I left, I had to call police to my apartment. Um, and like, I wasn't, I'll just, I won't go into details. I'll just say I wasn't bleeding or anything, but it was out of control enough that I had, I called the police, which is a statement in itself for me to call the police. Uh, there were two lady officers that showed up and a lot of people's assumption is that the police will be on the woman's side and they were not, they were, act, they were actually, they were actually very professional. They were urging me to press charges which I, I, I wouldn't do. I think that's pretty typical of people in my situation for some reason. It's typical of male chivalry, and often it works against the best interests of the child. Uh, and it did. It really has. Yeah. Um, and uh, then they tried, next they tried to convince me to take my child, she was sleeping at this time, try to take my child out of the apartment while they were there, and I wouldn't do that either. So, Good heavens, you were very naive. Yeah, oh, I was totally. I was totally naive. And... Um, so anyways, the officers, they did the job very well, and I haven't seen the report, but it's been entered into the court, and apparently it was, like, they did their job, and they and they were not, as you say, they were not naive about the reality of how of these situations go. They assessed it very quickly that there was something wrong uh, with this situation, and in court, um, it seems to me that the judge and then later the social worker were very quickly, uh, same with the psychologist involved with my daughter. They all seemed to understand that there were certain problems with my wife right away. Yeah. Uh, but they had to slowly work the system and slowly get to the point where we could get to where we are now, where some progress is being made. It's taken like a year and a half. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Did they at any point perhaps think that she might have a personality disorder? Well, that is now the concern. So the recommendation finally from the social worker uh, has been that one of the many recommendations, one of them is that she get an evaluation, psychological evaluation. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, she is obviously the primary caregiver for our child and uh, enough people in her investigation. Um, are you familiar with over here? I don't know if you have it in England, uh, the office of the uh, family lawyer. Well, we have a, a really the, um, an organization called CAFCAS that represents the best interests of the child. Okay, probably the same type of thing. Yeah, 
Yeah, and so the social worker was sent in to represent our daughter without concern to what my wife or I would want. And, uh, yeah, her review was quite scathing about what's been going on towards my wife and quite supportive about my position and concern about uh, a number of things, right? So, yeah, and that recommendation, hopefully the judge will take it seriously. and will because even I, like, I, I have been investigating different types of psychology over the years, the last few years, trying to get some kind of grasp of understanding of what's been happening to her as she's been deteriorating. This behavior has been emerging, right? Well, presumably, I mean, she's one of the, the major uh, conditions that I have to deal with for women, and particularly it affects women. It can affect men, obviously. But it's a condition called narcissistic exhibitionism, and they make very dangerous parenting because essentially... The, 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 the needs for the narcissist to continually be in the center of attention, to be continually adored, and any attempt to challenge a narcissist, and you just end up with a ball of rage. Oh, wow. Well, I guess hopefully we'll see. I'll, I'll be able to learn what it is. It'll be nice to hear somebody from an outside perspective. I, you know, and I get the sense, uh, this is kind of like as an aside, this probably works for anyone in any situation. I got the sense that as this deterioration began, at first, it was not this bad. She was just kind of quirky at first, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then a few years ago, a number of years back, it started, and I told her at some point, look, you need to go and talk to someone about this. And I think if she had, she probably could have mitigated how far down the rung she fell. Well, I, I'm not a professional, the, but it's a guess. Well, with a personality disorder, uh, one of the problems is that as soon as they're challenged or not believed <clears throat> or not the center of attention, that's when they begin to deteriorate. And she's got no one, presumably, unless she's moved another man in, she's got no one there to bounce off. So she's probably very lost. Yeah. And she's being questioned by social work. That'll make her very angry. Because yeah. you are the enemy. <laughs> she's definitely angry. Yeah. The, the best I can do is that when we are, the time that we do see each other is when I see my daughter, right? I get her, I get to see her on Saturdays. And like that's what I mean about the system. Like it moves so slow. I was denied access for nine months, yeah. uh, and then when that got to court and that was realized, the, he just the judge, you know, tried arguing with my wife and her lawyer because they wouldn't stop arguing with him, and then finally appeased them with six hours on Saturday. And that's what I've been at since. And but the nine months of denied access was never dealt with in any way. And the tragedy you see, and what you've got to be so careful of, is parental alienation. Because if she, at this very young age, begins to talk about you as the monster, as the bastard, as the man who's making life impossible, if she sees her mother crying and weeping and wailing, her, the child's core beliefs about who you are will be set in her brain. Yes. And this is what they realize. And then suddenly, not only will the child begin to believe that you are the monster, but also will feel furiously guilty when she spends any time away from her mother. Yeah, and see, now I've got an education in the things you're talking about from firsthand, or I wouldn't have known any of this stuff. But uh, again, to the credit of people involved in the court, the social worker pointed that out exactly in the paperwork, exactly what you just said. She cited a couple of examples of how she knows my wife has been doing that. Yeah. Saying things about me to my daughter when I'm not there. And uh, and she put that into her recommendations as being extremely important that we have uh, not split custody, but uh, joint custody so that I have a say in everything that goes on with her medical and her education. Would you not go for um, for uh, custody? Completely? Well, see, that's my what my lawyer is going to do now is he's going to talk to her lawyer about the recommendations because so my lawyer used to be a family court judge. And then he retired, and then he came out of retirement to take a few cases here and there. So I actually was really lucky that he took yes, my you case. Are. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so what he said is, we're going to put this forward and say, let's adopt all the recommendations and put that to the court, and they'll put it in place. Yeah. Uh, and if they say no, then he's going to say, okay, then we're because you're ignoring this rec- these recommendations when we go to court, we're going to tell the judge that we're going to change over to full custody for our for our side. Yeah. And it's really, she's if she does that, she's just leaving us no choice. Like, I've tried to be reasonable every step of the way. To pr- Can I to just pr- say something to you? Yeah. You know how many men have said that to me? <laughs> my answer is, you because you're male, yeah. you are rational. And the point is, this is going to be an irrational situation. And you have to learn to think like your wife, irrationally. Yeah. Because otherwise, you're going to play into her hands. 
I mean, setting aside my own personal lessons, though, uh, going yeah. along and learning this all, like I say, a, it's a rude awakening, right? You're, I was learning through experience. The thing that anyone should be able to look at from the outside and start dissecting from, um, you know, watching maybe someone they know go through it, is that the, the people involved have been very responsible, except maybe her lawyer, but I can't tell because right, she's got to represent her client. But everyone seems to have understood what's going on and has tried everything to work towards getting us to this point. Uh, You're from, extremely lucky. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think everyone in the system is to blame, but the system itself is set up to favor one side, you know. Which is the feminine side, yeah. Yeah, and I have, I have a real problem with that. And I think a lot of people don't understand until they, like myself, go through it or someone they really care about gets put yeah, through their get, ringer. Then suddenly the whole horrific thing falls apart and they realize. I think, I think one of the other things that I've been saying, which I know is not going to happen in my lifetime, the way you have a personality disorder, I think you need to take it out of the courts because the courts can't deal with them. Because you have to remember, anybody with a personality disorder, lying is a way of life for them. There's yeah. no doesn't matter how many oaths you all make to take. They'll lie. It's a level playing field at the moment. So you find yourself in a situation where everything you say is believed, everything she says. But the problem is that with a personality disorder, they are massively manipulative. The Family Terrorist by Aaron Pitsy. A relatively well-balanced person, however, will not only be aware of their own distress, but also sensitive in some de degree to the suffering of the other family members. For example, reasonably well-balanced parents when facing divorce will be most concerned with their children's emotional well-being even beyond their own grief. Not so the emotional terrorist. To the family terrorist, there is only one wronged, one sufferer, only one person in pain, and this person is the terrorist herself. The terrorist has no empathy and feels only her own pain. In this manner, the terrorist's capacity for feeling is narcissistic, solipsistic, and in fact, pathological. Unusually, I think you're very lucky in that you got this judge as your social, as your um, as your lawyer. But usually, what happens, and is that the person who has the personality disorder uses the courts often like their own personal theatre. Yeah, and they can drag the whole thing out for years. Yeah, and the entire time, um, you you know, I'm watching my child, my daughter, try and struggle with. Um, trying to understand what is happening and trying to please her mother and also try to be happy with her dad. Yeah, and bearing all that weight on her shoulders. Yeah. And that's what's so very unfair because your ex-wife is putting an enormous amount. Of, it's just a ve it's what uh, people with who can't put the children's interests first, and she can't. Her needs will always come above her daughter's, and her daughter is a weapon. I think a huge step forward for courts, mm -hmm. um, like I say, my... my lawyer used to be a judge for many years yeah as he told me and i was stunned he said there is no money set aside to pay for psychologists for any kind of evaluation for the court yeah and i, I couldn't understand like well sometimes isn't it necessary to have an evaluation and he says well that money's just not set aside so if we have to have one you're probably gonna have to pay for it yeah. for for her I said, that seems really bizarre like there's got to be times when people like i don't know how i'm gonna afford it <laughs> it's gonna be pretty expensive yeah. Uh, there's got to be times when people just, there's no way they can afford it. That's quite right. And the thing is, nobody, the very difficult business, because the whole concept of personality disorders is fairly new, and nobody really wants to have to make a judgment. And one of the reasons why it is now becoming, and will it will change, is because MRI scans can show the, the damage in the brain. And no doubt your ex-wife came from a very damaging background. I've, um, I'm not sure about that because all the things that she said about her family tend to shift around. Yeah, um, sure So I know, you know, I've met some of her family. The people I've met, um, I, though they, everyone has their, like I say, their their issues, their quirks. They all seem to be nice people. <laughs> I, everyone seems nice, yeah. Yeah, they all seem nice. Going on underneath, don't worry about. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what happened uh, along the way, but uh, I, you know, I think, I think one of the missteps is that. I've heard this before. Psychology has some problem with feminism as well, where if the term hysteria, for instance, is used, uh, feminists will say, 
That's a sexist term. No, a histronic. It's called a histronic personality disorder. It affects both men and women. Yes. That's why I try telling them. And they're like, no, it's used against women to silence them. No. <laughs> well, I mean, then there, there are people with core beliefs. You won't change their beliefs because they're core beliefs. They're what they actually have built because of their own sad experiences. If you challenge them, you'll just make them angry. Yeah, and uh, the one that uh, I think that we're talking about here is personality disorder is often conflated with attacking the person. You know, if I say that um, that my ex-wife has these behaviors and I think it might be personality disorder, my wife would probably return while well, you're just trying to degrade me or undermine me. But... Uh, because Actually, no, because I think one of the things that you could say to her, which you can't, you could say, no, because it gives me a greater understanding of why you do the things you do. Right. And I, you know, from my perspective, I, I've always said that I want my daughter to have a healthy relationship with her mom. Like, that's really important to me. But she won't. Yeah. It's not possible. Well, yeah. I, I, if she gets treatment, if if she would switch her attitude at some point and, and just reach out for help, I think that that could change. But... The, the personality to rescue her. Well, I was going to say the person I, I'm not in any delusions about that. The personality disorders are the most difficult to treat because yeah. they don't do that. They kind of they kind of perceive it as part of themselves. Yeah. If you could. The thing is, if you could wish for her to have insight, she wouldn't be who she is. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's, it, I mean, and often when I look into the past histories of people with personality disorders, I can feel an enormous amount of compassion for them. But, I, and I have to be straight here, my mother was a classic narcissistic exhibitionist. I was lucky as a child because I very early on realized that she had no time for me. I looked like my father, which gave her a good reason to hate me. My, the, my twin sister she was was much closer to my mother and she was far more damaged than i was because i stood aside and one of the things is you you can't afford to give too much credence to whether your wife's going to change or not because what you need to do is rescue your daughter certainly when she's much older she can negotiate uh, her understanding and understanding her mother but at this young age she's in danger yeah yeah and uh, I told uh, them in the system every step of the way, um, because at one point I thought I was being so reasonable with them that they might be misunderstood. So I laid it out for the social worker and my lawyer, point blank. I said, I am willing to change. Like I say, I'm a truck driver. I said, I am willing to change everything right away and become primary caregiver if we can't work something reasonable out here. Like if something can't change, that's what I'm willing to do. I just didn't want them to think that I was trying to find a way out of that responsibility. Yeah, it's it is a difficult place uh, for people to be in. And yeah, you know, I, I was just I was listening to you talk one day and I remember you're talking about uh, that you were helping set up these shelters. And I thought, yeah, you know, I've never known a world without that. But what you see the tragedy from the very beginning is recognizing as I did that it wasn't a gender issue and men were also victims. When I tried to set up a men's house, I actually got a physical building. But none of the men who were millionaires in my early experience with work shops, none of them would give me a penny for men. And everybody's found this anywhere where they're trying to set up shelters, whether it's America or Australia or New Zealand. When it comes to a place for men, nobody wants to know. Wow. This is like you set up for women, people reach out in compassion. Sure. Yeah. And then if you do it for men, is it's kind of like a thing where they're like, well, those men must be weak or they deny that it exists, that, the problem? It's how men think about men. The only time you actually get traction is when it's happened to them. And then they suddenly realize. But by that time, they're usually homeless and penniless. And I noticed in Canada, if a man couldn't pay his child support, which often they can't by the time they've been ruined, they go to jail, they lose their passports, they lose their driving license. It's a tragedy. Now, when you, when you first started setting up uh, the shelters, um, was there a time that um, many feminists maybe uh, started using your name in a positive way before they decided to no 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 it was it was a fight straight off because i had when i opened the first shelter there was nothing in the world there was no recognized place in those for women to come to with children who would take them in and fight the battle i was the first and i knew and this is the frightening thing having been thrown out by the whole feminist movement, i knew that once the whole story broke and the idea that yes domestic violence is happening behind front doors and there was any a, a media attention and money that they, I, the feminists would come and they did. I had uh, three years from 71 to 74. By 74, 
they had realized that now they had a just cause violence towards women and they also had uh, funding and it's become a billion dollar industry and slowly as these as the movement grew and more and more radical feminists came in uh, uh, the harder it came for men to have any any sense of justice oh that's you know so it's, a, it's, a, it's like a, a fight for control a fight for the the public dialogue well, no, because it isn't, it, isn't, it isn't a fight in a way, it's a pushover because there isn't any dialogue in Canada. There are men's, trying to, men's groups, there are men trying to get justice and shelters and women helping with them. There's a huge amount of women who understand exactly what we're saying, but I don't know the setup with your government, but certainly in our country, the women's minister, she's been minister for quite a while, and she's also leader of the, of the, lab, of the shadow cabinet, the Labour leader. Uh, Harriet Harman has publicly said in 1990 that men are not necessarily harmonious to family life. And Patricia Hewitt and other our members of Parliament said, yes, we need men in primary schools, but men can't be trusted with children. I mean, this is the attitude coming from our governments. Just recently, our Prime Minister, David Cameron, lauded the role of single parent mothers and said and called all other men feckless fathers. No understanding that the majority of men are not feckless, they are banned and barred from their families. Yeah, I've noticed uh, a number of things have made a lot more sense to me since uh, you know, my understanding has become le less about what was presented to me and more about what is, is really going on yeah. in the family courts. Uh, everything has been set up to make me walk away. Yes. Uh, even the understanding that I have actually been surprised that she hasn't accused me of certain things in the court. Uh, she did accuse me of being violent, but the court seems to have ignored that when she said it. <laughs> she said it twice, and the judge seems to have pretended like he didn't hear it. Um, so I, I've been quite fortunate that way. But I've now I'm looking around at a number of my, uh, even cousins, a couple of my cousins, where their father wasn't in their life, and now they've reconnected, and there's a lot of anger towards yeah. their mother, and people don't understand why. And I think it's because the system was set up to say to the father, look, if you pursue this, you might go to jail yes. or, or you can walk away. What they told me in, in Canada is, uh, and, and what I saw for myself, is the shelters are bunkers for brainwashing women. And it was very interesting because they described man comes home and he finds his house empty, his children gone and various possessions taken. That's called hoovering. So she's gone off to the shelter and he won't know where she is. Nobody has to tell him by law. Then, if the woman finds that she can't get what she wants quick enough, then she would be advised to use the silver bullet. And the silver bullet is being accused of sexual abuse. And my advice to anybody who's got a wife who's liable to make false allegations, if you have the child, always make sure you have a witness. Yeah, yeah. It's too dangerous otherwise. Because even if it's just set up as a scare, that could take another whole couple of years while you go through all the evaluations again. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I started listening to a few programs, and my understanding of where a lot of these problems come from, in a larger sense, uh, like society-wise, how people kind of just they don't question it. They're presented with something like I was. I was presented with a lot of these ideas uh, that um, feminism wants people to perceive in a certain way. I I was a, I absorbed them because I wanted to be a good person. I I cared about women. You want to be a good man. Yeah. And yeah. you are chivalrous, and because uh, I think men have a chivalrous gene, and there is something very shame making about you daring to question women. Right, uh, and a lot of the ideas that feminism says they own are good ideas, but they don't own them exclusively. So where I became aware of how to start tackling these issues was I listened to a program. It actually was in Canada back from I think eighty seven called the Massey Lectures. Had Doris Lessing. Oh yeah. Yeah, she is someone, that's why I asked you, actually, uh, if you at first were, like, uh, received or cited at all by feminists before they turned on you. She had that experience where she was at first claimed to be one of theirs as an author. She, she's one of ours. She's a feminist. And in her talk at some point, I'm not sure if it was this one or another one, she said that she realized that they were saying that about her book. Yeah. And no, so she, she said quite early on, no, I, I, I'm not a feminist. Yeah. No, I, 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 from the very beginning, I think I, I swallowed what was being put in the newspapers uh, in, in, in the 70s, late 69 in America, 70s in England. And I, I sat up one day reading this newspaper article 
about this wonderful new movement for women where women would stop competing with each other we'd start working together yeah and i got very excited because i very naively thought this was about doing creating community centers where we could meet with our children so when i went up to the first big collectives and i heard them standing there saying that the, the family is a dangerous place for women and any of us who were married and sleeping with our husbands were sleeping with the enemy. But most of all, I recognized the Marxism in it all because my father and mother were captured by uh, the, the Chinese when they went to Tianjin in 49. And they were under house arrest for three years. So I knew a lot about communism. And so when I saw the, the, the demands, the 24-hour nurseries and all the rest of it, and then we were told that we had to meet in collectives in our own homes, and you invited your friends once a week, and you had to raise your consciousness and call each other comrade. I said at the time to all of them, so this is nothing to do with the women's movement, and it never was. Yeah. It was just a different way of funding. So now women have created a woman-only place for themselves, whether it's in universities, and as you know, men are being pushed out of universities, whether it's in publishing, where, wherever it is, they're in positions of power particularly in the judiciary and the legal system. Yeah, and so it's ideology. That's what you're talking about, right? It yeah. becomes an overarching ideology it is. That, yeah. in, that includes certain uh, a, a certain structure of ideas and you have to conform to all of them or yeah. you you are a bad person. And you need yes. to be... You're a victim blamer. You're a hater of women. Yeah. So that's create hate crimes. You know, I, I'm a part of a number of groups, uh, some of them secularist groups online. Uh, and even in real life, when I talk to people now, that's what I say. Is that it, you know what you're what you're talking about? I don't have a problem with us discussing it as long as we're allowed to disagree on different points. I'm not interested in ideology. I you know individual ideas, individual uh, specific things. We should be able to disagree with sure. with without seeing the other person as an evil person. But then you see you again. You're being rational. <laughs> the majority, to be absolutely honest with you. The majority of people I've met who are so-called leaders of the women's movement, and I won't name them, but I know them because I've been there from the beginning. They are women who I have always considered had serious personality disorders, and it's a religion for them. And you dare, it's a heresy to say anything that isn't what is coming out of their mouths. And it's enormously powerful. And my real concern is Hillary Clinton. If she gets in, then there will be, she is one of the, the, the arch enemies for women, actually. Yeah, I've, I've, I remember, so this is how quickly it's changed. I remember when she was running against Obama for trying to get the nomination. Mm -hmm. um, I actually supported her because of a lot of her stances on things and, and various reasons. Yeah. And I was a little disappointed when he got it. It will set aside uh, any agreements or disagreements I have with him because that's just yeah. politics. But um, uh, now over time, I've been hearing some of the statements she's made as senator, as uh, um as uh, not, they don't call it minister, sec secretary of state, mm -hmm. and some of them have been crazy talk, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's just this wild, off the wall feminism. The statements just are not. I don't know. Like, there's no planet for them. <laughs> no, no, they're not. No, and I, and I know that the Violence Against Women's Act, which is in, in it is uh, is America, mm -hmm. um, and, and they have I think something like a billion and something a year in, in terms of funding largely from taxpayers, most of that money goes towards so-called perpetrators, all men, of course, and the programs, and the programs use the Duluth model. And it's it's a terrifying prospect because the man, before he can even receive this so-called treatment, has to agree that he's a member of the patriarchy, and then by definition, he's guilty. Uh, the patriarchy thing, I, uh, I don't think that I really understood that it was what they use it as i thought that it was just a reference to uh an older time when men ruled things and had a religious connotation no, uh, no, no, no. it is by it, it is by a male child but is a, a potential perpetrator when they used to pick at me for all those years i'd have banners outside saying all men are rapists all men are batterers and that is the ideology men are the enemy right and they that's that's what i've come to realize is that when i get into these discussions now that this, like, because I was raised, I don't go to church anymore, but I was raised in church. So when they talked about patriarchs in church, they were talking about Abraham or, you know, Isaac was, and, yeah. and maybe King David if you, yeah. for some. So it just meant, you know, these it had this kind of cultural uh, pseudo-religious reference, you know, uh -huh. to the, these men way back in the day who were like, you know, in charge back then and, and everyone flows from them sort of thing. 
And so when I would start hearing this more recently, it took me a while to really realize that they're not using this word properly at all. <laughs> no, they're not. No, they're not. I mean, it's, it's a bigoted religion. Like I said, that's all you can say about it. It's just extremely dangerous. It's done the most awful amount of damage to family life. And it's done, apart from anything else, it's done awful damage to women. Because I don't know about what's happening in Canada, but here, where we have a very big welfare state, which is largely all many, many single parent women have to live on. They now, by the time their child is five, they have to start looking for work and, uh, and childcare. So what is happening is the state is now demanding that women have to leave their homes and go to work full time. And uh, uh, there is nobody home for children. The concept of a home with a mother or possibly a father in it, it now doesn't exist. Yeah, it's sad. It's very sad because it fulfills. And when you look at what happened in China when they tried it, and Russia, and you realize it's still going on in the West, across the Western world. Oh, I know what it was. I just remembered, I was trying to think before, what it was that Hillary said that first set my radar to her. Yeah. She said that, uh, this is when she was still Secretary of State, that the real victims of war are women. I know, isn't that amazing? She's referring to the ones at home, and I understand that women do suffer a lot, and maybe we ignore that they're element of war. Yeah, but they're not dead. Yeah, and they're not in the trenches, and... <laughs> yeah, they're not mutilated, they're not, you know, paraplegic gyps. I mean, yeah, sure, it's, it's, it's agony when you, your child is killed. I, I think... I mean, the fact is that, that, that if Hillary, in her blinkered way, can only see it from a, women, a radical women's right. perspective, then there's something seriously wrong with her thinking. Because all she would have to say is that women also suffer during times of war. Any kind of any kind of statement like that, I could easily go, well, of course, yes. But as soon as she's like, they're the real, that then it's, it's exclusionary. Like, men aren't really the victims we think of because they're a bunch of fighting jerks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hopefully she doesn't become the next president uh, because I, I, you know, I don't know how much she could do as president, but I don't want to find out. No, you, you definitely don't. I also don't want Sarah Palin, but, you know, two extremes. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so when you, uh, when you do your work now uh, and you go around and talk to people, what are, the, what are the major misconceptions that you're running up against? I know we've talked about some probably already. Well, first start, I'm banned from any feminist conferences, right? I'm banned from even going up the steps of my own refuge because it's run by a radical feminist. So all the refuges, virtually all except perhaps a handful, are actually run by uh, feminists in the National Federation or whether it's the other ones called refuge. And those, basically no men are allowed to work in the refuges. Boys over 12 or sometimes 9 aren't allowed in. Mothers have to make other arrangements for them. No men can. It's, it's a feminist, I, whatever. And it's been a massive fraud. It's been a, a multi-million pound fraud across the Western world because the premise that all men of the, uh, all women are victims of men's violence is proven internationally in all the research, all the studies. That it's not a gender issue; it's a family issue. Right. So it's now a question of a tipping point coming. And when we are there now, a couple of years ago, I was in a, a huge festival here called Wow Women of the World, and it happens on. Um, uh, you know, Women's Day on March the 8th. And I went to speak and I was asked to speak and it was a room packed with women, people standing outside, people stand up against the walls. And the most exciting thing for me was normally I would be attacked at least by half the room. This time there was a complete understanding that when I finished speaking and said, until men and women come together to work on problems of family violence, nothing is going to change. And these much younger women all stood up for that. So when I'm speaking now, I don't get picketed. I don't get screamed at. People listen. And I, on Friday, I was with a group of social workers who all absolutely understood what I was saying. And in fact, they had many of them been working with men in social services situations. So it is changing. Uh, I'm glad about that. Yeah. Oh, it's about time too, though. <laughs> yeah. Right. And... Uh... I've seen the footage recently in, uh, now I know you weren't there, uh, I forget the different speakers that they had there, but it's in Tr Farrell. University of Toronto they tried having. That was Warren Farrell, that was an, an, another, there was another woman who was speaking at another conference. Yes, just recently um, they have been you know, storming the conferences and screaming and yelling and, and behaving really outrageously. But So one of my... Um, 
one of my, I'll just say, one of my mentors in life, I went to the university for theater. Mm-hmm. One of my mentors in theater and in life, is an amazing, uh, amazing woman. She uh, refers to herself as a feminist, amongst other things that she is active in. And so during all of this, she has had, I think, a very interesting time watching, my, you know, listening to the things that have been going on with me. Yeah. And she, I find her, she's, she's got her own ideas, but I find her caring and reasonable in that uh, I remember her, the way she put it when she's talking about, when I was talking about how I hadn't seen my daughter in nine months, uh, she said, maybe the pendulum in family court has swung the other way. So she's she's open to hearing what people have to say. So, yes. Um, it's been swung for a very long time, actually. It's yeah. slowly beginning to come back. But it all, all depends on your circles you're in, right? If you don't see someone you know going through it, yes. you're kind of insulated from the effects. You're not feeling That's it yourself. Right. Yeah, it's, just, it's nothing to do with me. So one of the things that I did point out, uh, I don't remember her commenting on it, but it was on my it was on my Facebook, so she probably saw it. Was that I pointed out that back in the day, I understand when women would get you know back in, you know say the twenties, they would get into the large lines together and they would chant and they would shout slogans about trying to make things change. And there was a certain context that they were by you know bound together because they might actually be physically attacked. Um, I think that there were there's some footage of some women actually being physically attacked on the street by men that are really angry at them for the things they're saying. But I said now things have changed. Now you I would I put I put up a link to the footage of these women making so much noise around the building you couldn't hear the speaker in the room. I said this is a bullying tactic. It is threatening. It is it is something to cause fear. Uh, this is no longer about trying to make a statement or a political change. This is about intimidation. So. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, remember, I had it for years and years and years. and well, Everybody involved. In fact, Mary Strauss, Richard Gellis, and Susan Steinmetz were the first uh, researchers in America. And I was actually invited out there to meet them. And this is before any research had been done. And they very bravely, believing what they had, had heard, which is this is what happens to women, began to do the research and very quickly realized exactly what I'd said, that it's not a, a gender issue. And they said so, and they started to produce their research. And they had, like I did, they had bomb threats and threats. Susan's family was threatened, and it went on for years and years. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's extremely difficult when it's that vicious. But you have to remember, it's vicious because it's about funding and money. Yes. It was now, never, ever about women who were victims. What you said before stunned me that, that these are the, you're, what you're saying is the shelters that you started. Yeah. You're no longer allowed in those shelters. No, no. In fact, I had a letter last year from my own refuge, which is which was called uh, Chiswick Women's Aid, and they call themselves Refuge. And when I refer to myself as the founder of the refuge movement, they've asked me not to use the word refuge because they don't want to be associated with what I have to say. Uh, what is their excuse for a stance like that? That they think that you are a threat of some kind? Yeah, yes, because they know that I know they're lying. It has been one huge, massive, nearly 50-year-old lie. Uh, that that all men are are, are are perpetrators and all women are victims. It's it's never been true ever, and that's very threatening when you've got you know when your huge salaries and vast offices given over to the ideology of some very sick women, as far as I'm concerned. Well, one of the things that you're we're talking about the control issues. Uh, you're talking about uh, money and finance. Uh, the way that this type of behavior always brims to the surface and becomes as extreme as it does, probably because of attention and money, the, the desirable effects, right, is this desire to control, to have the power to say who gets punished, how, who's allowed to speak, who's allowed to enter. Yeah. Um, for myself, I, have, uh, I haven't gone to uh, conferences, but I am involved with a lot of different groups and people uh, in the atheist and the secular movement or uh, the skeptics movements. And over the last couple of years, there was a sudden insurrection to take control by extreme feminists. And a lot of these people were well known, well liked by people across the board for their work. Uh, and I, what I have discovered is we looked the other way for their mistreatment of believers. And then when they started doing it to us, then suddenly we realized that it was inappropriate. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But that's exactly what they did is they started by saying, uh, you're either with us or against us. If you're not with us, then you're a sexist, you're a misogynist, uh, you're a rape apologist. 
and they started trying to control who could speak at conferences, who was on the board for conferences. Uh, they wanted, they literally would write uh, a, a new enforcement policy and say to the conferences, this is your enforcement policy, adopt it or you are against feminism. Um, the, the kind of control obsession that I find from them is, is disturbing. But you, but you, it's only, you know, because one of the, the, the primary things that the women's movement said when it all began, the personal is political. And the personal is political means that the disordered personality, which many of them have, uh, will actually not only be in their private life, where they're control freaks, but it'll also be in their public life. Right. And wow. then they, and, and it is, in, in a sense, I think you have to say that to be a radical feminist, you have to be pretty disordered because you, you are believing in something that hates the other half of the human race. And yeah. in order to do that, you are in your own way, whether you're a Nazi or you're a whatever, all the other forms of control and, 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 and really tyrants are a Stalinist or whatever. Um, there's no point in reasoning with them. And they will give their, their whole life is dedicated to creating that power and control. Yeah. And in fact, if the, one of the things about the conferences when all the women's got together was just how the fighting was terrifying, actually. All the different factions. The the the, the combativeness. Uh, you know, are you trying to? You know, when I try to convince someone of something, I, it might get out of hand and it might get a little, uh, you know, overboard because people believe things that you know the passion can can build up. But as a rule, when you're trying to talk to someone about something and trying to convince them or help them see your point of view, uh, saying to them, "Look, you're going to see my point of view, or we're going to call you this terrible name." And we're going to ban you from ever speaking. And we're going to ban you from attending these places. And if you do show up, we're going to make these rules that make sure you get in trouble. We're going to call the police. That is not a way to convince people. It doesn't seem like you're not trying to win them over with truth. You're being rational again. <laughs> being with irrational people. Yeah. Uh, I guess. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. I remember this huge promise that there was going to be this new movement for women which was going to unite women and I thought it sounded absolutely wonderful the idea that women would work with each other instead of competing against each other I never really believed in that early 70s were all oppressed sort of feminism I joined a feminist group looking for friendship not revolution so I remember going to my first meeting and we walked into this big room and there were lots of Chairman Mao posters and women with guns in their hands, and liberation posters, I subsequently found out. But they were very intimidating. And I'm looking at the other women who were also new, like I was. And I remember she asked me why I'd come. And I said, well, I'd come because I was lonely and isolated, and I'd hoped to meet other women who wanted to do something in our communities. And she found that really silly remark and she said very angrily to me that my problem was my husband and that he was oppressing me and that it was all linked to capitalism and I remember trying to argue and pointing out that I considered a luxury to be able to stay home and look after my children that he paid the mortgage so I didn't see where he was oppressing me. Uh, for me watching it was like a slow train wreck. Uh, yes. You know, because like I said, at first it was just kind of uh, these uh, these groups uh, tend to have a lot of liberals in them. Yes. And I used to identify, you know, when I was younger as conservative. Then after university experience, I became a liberal. And then as I became more experienced in the real world, I don't really identify as either, except on a case by case basis. I'll decide, you know, what to think. Uh, but I've accepted a lot of my friends uh, are really liberal, and so this idea tends to just flow with a lot of the liberals yes, um, because they have no personal experience to balance what they're thinking right and that's the thing is that when this happened it took a while for a lot of uh, not just me but a lot of liberals to go oh wait a second someone's accusing me of being a rape apologist because yeah. i didn't necessarily agree with one little point and over time it was like again for them it was like a rude awakening like well maybe maybe everything we're told about this word and this movement isn't what we've been told yeah you know most people are asleep they live their lives asleep and they're happy to be asleep. It's, they don't want to be woken up. And so they absorb whatever the, 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 whatever the, the soup of the day is. If you go along and say, hang on a minute, I want you to open your eyes. They're not going to like you for it. 
It's much easier to be asleep. It's painful to really look at what happens. Yeah. I had, for me, I had a, there was a two-step uh, thing where it finally came to, to, to blows between me and this ideology I was permeating. As uh, one, they went after someone that I've been listening to for two years named Reap Payton. Mm -hmm. uh, they just started, he stuck up for someone that he knew and they just pile on him. And well, he, he's the type of guy rather than um, bowing down or, or running away because it's too much. He thrives on fighting bullies. Mm -hmm. So they picked the wrong guy and it was a two, like a year, year and a half battle where he was just constantly putting them in their place. So that was the first thing. The second thing was that there's uh, in Canada, there's a podcaster he, in his real life. He's a scientist mm -hmm. and they had a 25 minute section on their skepticism show um, where they offered no evidence to back up any of their accusations or ideology. And when I made a comment, first comment I had ever made on a podcast, <laughs> I made a comment. He immediately asked me the question uh, whether I was the type of guy that issues rape threats online. That was his reply from a scientist. Why? Because I was questioning feminism. So I must be someone who goes online yeah. and and uh, threatens rape. That's, yeah. Again, that's not a rational question, is it? And that is, you know, like I say, as a skeptic who talks about evidence, like he'll talk about vaccinations and stuff like this on his show. So I had never, I just listened for science purposes, yeah. right? And then when all of a sudden this, ep this section came up, it was out of nowhere. It was completely uncharacteristic of the show. And I'll admit my comment was maybe to the point. It was a little pointed, but I wasn't swearing or threatening or anything like that. And I used my real name. <laughs> uh, and so I later, some people would try to be apolo apologizers for him because they like his show. And I said, look, if we had been talking about child abuse, right, and he had made a comment uh, you know, on my show, and he had made a comment to me disagreeing on particulars like how to prevent child abuse, and he disagreed with me. And by disagreeing, my return was, by the way, are you someone who looks at kitty porn? Mm. Then it would become immediately obvious how inappropriate the question was. There, there's just no call for it. No, but I wonder what made him so threatened. It's well, it's because there's no defending the basis of the ideology. When you really get into the nuts and bolts, it's self, it's self defeating. It's hypocritical. That's well, that's my opinion. Unfortunately, one of the worst offenders in this whole discussion about radical feminism are other men. Because men, A, don't actually stand together. No, so we don't. Just recently, I've noticed, and I was so glad. It was only probably a couple of years ago, I found a Voice for Men, the online um, program. Yep. And suddenly, there were men actually getting together and really making changes. And uh, But one of the things, I mean, I've toured other countries and looked at men's groups. Men's groups fell apart one after the other because men didn't know how to deal with each other over emotional issues. And it's one of the biggest laments from men's groups is so many men will come, they'll take all the help they need, and then when they've resolved their problem, they go off. Now, women don't do that. We are within our own psyche. Women are actually enormously supportive of each other normally um, and, and, and actually obviously confide in each other in a way that men don't. And it's made it very hard because uh, what should have happened all those years ago is groups of men who should have got together and said, this is simply dangerous. You're destroying family life. You're destroying our roles as fathers. For such a long time across the Western world, the whole concept of the need for fathers was considered a joke. No men aren't necessary. Fathers aren't necessarily, as Harriet Harman, our member of parliament says, men aren't necessarily harmonious to family life. And Patricia Hewitt says, but we can't trust men with children. And these are in positions of power, these women. And they're the same in your country, they're the same in America, Australia, anywhere you look. You are, um, you are also uh, an author. Yes. Um, now, you've written a number of books, but if I remember correctly, it's been a while since I heard you talking about it. Wasn't there one of your books that came out that particularly enraged yeah. the feminists? I had to have a police escort around England when I published Prone to Violence. Wow. You only stick on the shelves for three weeks. But uh, essentially, yes, it was my treatment program for violence prone women. And the book is called Prone to Violence. And it talks about women's violence and treatment. Because my feeling is not to judge. Those of us that were born and raised in violence deserve a second chance. And those of us who were born into these dysfunctional families never learn how to live with any kind of peace or harmony. Your strategies for survival tend to be very, very dangerous for you as an individual. And uh, that's why most of the work I did in the refuge was with violent women and their children, 
and uh, because essentially uh, I recognized that they needed counseling. Men and women who by accident get into a violent relationship need support, they probably need refuge, they need uh, solicitors, they need that kind of help, but many of them don't, once they understand the issue, don't need long-term counselling. But I offered long-term residential counselling and that was all closed down because no women needed any kind of treatment or counselling because all women are innocent victims. So the women going into the refuges who were violent themselves and their children were told that they were innocent victims and any kind of violence was only in self-defense. Wow. Which put women in a very difficult position because it gave them no help. Yeah, and some of the, if, if they're willing to reach out for help, it should be there. It's very important to be there. They can't be at the moment. Uh, it is getting better, as I say. I think we've reached a tip point, and I think it'll, there'll come a time when sufficient research and sufficient people on top levels. I do a radio program every second week for, for a Voice for Men radio, and we talk to people like Murray Strauss and all the key people in the field, and anybody can find it on YouTube and listen. And uh, getting even being able to get all these people together uh, to talk about these issues is wonderful, particularly for men or women who don't have access to this sort of information. Yeah. Yeah, Often, and you know, don't even recognize that they're being abused. They've been they've been abused by their mothers, and they have made remade the relationships with their partners who have the same personality disorders as their mothers, which is a tragedy. And they don't even wake up until it's far too late. I remember in my uh, initial interview with the social worker that represented my daughter. Yeah, she sat down with me, and I was later told by somebody uh, who works with foster children. They said, well, when you talk to her, you need to be very honest. And I said, well, I just, that's the way I am. Yeah. So I think she responded well to the fact that I was, she knew I was just answering right off the cuff. I wasn't <laughs> trying to, to yeah. compose my answers just right or anything. Uh, and at one point, though, when I was talking about my experiences uh, living in the home over the last few years, the social worker who does this work all the time put her pen down and looked at me and she goes, Corey, why the hell did you stay there so long? Yeah. Good and question. it was a real moment of, of, I felt really ashamed though. I was like, the only thing I can, I can think to tell you is that when you're in that situation, you're just trying to hold your family together and you're not clear on what's happening. Yeah. Like looking back clearly, I can see what you're saying. Like now I know, mm -hmm. but at the time you're trying, you're doing it out of love, right? You're trying to hold it all together. And also you're trying to make it better, particularly men. They will, they will try and try and try. Yeah. And, uh, and, um, and the, the feeling that you, if you can't make her better, then you're the failure. And for a long time, an awful lot of men think it's all their fault anyway. Yeah. Well, a lot of the time, it's just talking to people who are confused because they see their partner who is violent and manipulative, and they don't realize there is a mask of sanity there that's there for a time, and then the mask comes off. Yeah, and I think for me, like I say, it was also that it deteriorated over time. Mm -hmm, it does. Yeah. And also, because you see, one of the things about violent people, there's always the honeymoon periods, because yeah. they never to play that game extremely well. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if, if you're very familiar um, with the skeptics movement. You, you deal with uh, AVFM. Some of them, I think, are involved in some ways with it. Well, I put, my position is simple. I've, I've never been uncomfortable with organized religion, but I am a lover of God in all his aspects. Or, be, you know, I don't see... Um, the creator of the universe is either male or female, but I believe passionately and I have a very strong relationship yeah. with my concept of God. Nobody else <laughs> <laughs> would actually even begin to know what it is, but I believe in it and it's personal. Well, there are, you know, there are some skeptics who are, uh, there's a lot of atheists in, the, in that movement. Um, there are some who are really uh, difficult to get along with if you do believe in God. But my background, um, I get into arguments with them a lot of times because my background is my whole family are Christians. Yeah. And I try reminding them not to lose sight of the fact that because someone believes does not mean they are a source of your problems. No, absolutely not. No, no, no. And again, you know, the, any kind of fanaticism, whether it's religious, you know, it, 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 it's not that, that different from radical feminism. You know, it is it is their core belief. And if you dare to cross that, that and even challenge it, they cannot deal with the dysfunction feeling that it gives them. Yeah. Well, as long as you can talk to someone about your disagreements in a, a productive fashion. Then you then, know they're normal. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if not, then but don't even waste, just don't waste your breath. 
That's, I'm terribly, you know, I have a shining path. And on that shining path, I only allow people who want to share in that love and that acceptance. And if they begin to bring their malign or toxic attitudes, then I don't let them on my path. I'll deal with them. I'll, 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 but I am very straight about what I'm prepared to have around me. Yeah, It's too short. The battle's too big. You cannot immerse yourself in, in the kind of negativity that people will pull you into. Cheese Wick. Women's. Aid. Archive. Circa. 1970s. Number two Belmont Terrace, a short life property, was leased to Chiswick Women's Aid by Hounslow Council as a community centre for women. The women did most of the decorating themselves. Erin Pitsey, who started the centre, had originally seen it just as a place where women could come to sit and chat. One room was used as a playgroup, another served as a discussion place where the women could sit and talk over their problems. And then it was at that time when this woman came in and just took her jersey off and showed us these appalling bruises and her breasts were just like sort of bowls of blue jelly and said that her husband had beaten her very badly and no one would help her. And she was standing in front of me and I knew what she meant. And it was very shattering for me because I'd believed that I was an isolated person within my own childhood experience and that there was help and provision because I believed in the social services and all the various other institutions. Um, so when she said nobody will help me, I knew what she meant and I said, you'd better stay. And she stayed. As the word spread locally, women started to come in. They just came to the doorstep with their children and said, please let me in, no one will help. And began to build up this dossier of terrible, relentless, uncaring on the, on the part of all the services in the country. Nobody seemed to be doing anything constructive to help. They just seemed to be sending these women back to the men who beat them, and some back to be killed. The open door policy of Chiswick Women's Aid meant that on average some 40 women and children were staying in the four-roomed house at any one time. After 18 months, the house was due for demolition. Well, the reason I brought up the skeptics movement um, is because, uh, as opposed to the, the atheist groups that are out there, the feminists really nailed the atheist groups. A lot of people were turned over. They started rewriting, like I say, the, the, the policies for enforcement and wrongdoing at the conferences. They got people fired from very important positions for not agreeing with them. Yeah. Um, well, when it came to the skeptics movements, there's kind of an interlinking with a lot of people between the two. But yeah. the difference is skepticism specifically is about evidence and yes. logic. So when they moved into that area, that was their mistake. Yeah. They really they overplayed their hand because they don't have evidence to back up their I mean, ideology. Actually don't. None of it. So what happened was I noticed that they went after a number of people. Um, some people have st really suffered for it, though. Like uh, Michael Shermer. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He uh, is one of the people who basically sets the pace for what skepticism is. He did a lot of the, he, he's presented a lot of the foundational work on how to reason out of your own biases. Mm -hmm. Well, he was accused publicly by another so-called skeptic who was a feminist um, of being uh, someone who went and got women drunk and raped them. Yeah, that was a very good, that's a tactic they've used a lot actually yeah. on leaders in the field, yeah. yeah. He's not the only one, they've done it to a couple of others. Right. And this is their way of, they target leadership or people yeah. who are considered really foundational or important. And they try to uh, smear them. Yeah, experience in publishing because I was writing novels, uh, and uh, I had I was because uh, you don't choose your editors; you get you, they they they're given to you. And of course, I didn't realize to begin with that the editors I was given were radical feminist editors. And in the eighties, they were epidemic in the publishing world, and they bankrupted me. They actually, I ended up they tore up my contract, and I ended up in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, I lost my house, I lost my daughter's house, I lost everything. Wow. And that's happened twice to me. It happened again about 10 years ago when I was in Italy writing novels and I didn't realize. Uh, but to cut a long story short, she remained at all my backlist for Harper Collins, so no one could get my books, no one, no libraries could get them. And she just said, you, no one will ever publish you again. So this book, This Way to the Revolution, it took me 10 years 
to find a publisher. It's a very small publisher, a very dedicated publisher. And they were quite convinced, that because it was my autobiography of those years, that they would get good publicity and reviews. And I said, there will not be one single review. And they used that word, which you will hear many times when you try and battle. Don't be paranoid. And of course, when the book came out, not one single review. Wow. But at least it's there and people can buy it. And it's on it as an e-book now as well. Oh, so they, good. That makes it really accessible when these days when you can put it on the ebook. That those t- kind of tactics really enrage me. You know, I believe in honest discourse. Uh, I uh, I had a fellow on our show. He's a biblical scholar. His name's Doctor Price. And uh, first of all, I love his work. Like, I follow his work on his podcasts and stuff like that. He's phenomenal. But the reason I had him on the show was because in these circles I've, I've been telling you about, he's he tends to be politically a conservative. He doesn't he doesn't talk about those views very much. <laughs> Whereas uh, I tend to lean left, he tends to lean right. But he's like me; he's like a case by case. But yeah, I've just noticed he has a lot of differing points of view. <laughs> yeah, but he doesn't talk about them. So I had him on my show, and we discussed that because I I told him I prefer when people not everyone in the room has to nod their head in agreement. I don't like that. How we disagree with each other is just as important, maybe more important than how we agree. Yeah. But the most important thing out of all this and everything that we've been saying is more and more people need to stand up and be counted. Yes. Because these women can only get away with it when it's in secret and they can pursue the people they see as their prey, which largely, unfortunately, is right the way across universities in the Western world because that's the feeding ground where they brainwash the young female students and men, male sometimes, young female students into this... Uh, uh, this 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 realization that all men are incredibly dangerous and uh, and there are factories now really many of the universities and the, the many of things tragedies that for many of the young girls it takes years for them to realize that it has been a completely abnormal uh, existence that they have been offered and uh, you know I guess I would say uh, in the end how what good is it to replace one set of victims with another um, if if people really want to address concerns that are particular to women, uh, they they can't do it in isolation, and they can't go about it dishonestly. Like I, I think most people are willing to have the discussion, but once you start demonizing the other sex in favor of one sex, then you're just tipping the balance to to cause the very problems that you've been saying that you're against. Again, yes, I understand that, um, but I suppose. Young girls are very vulnerable, particularly if they have had violent fathers, and they're often the ones that are most likely to be brainwashed successfully and then move on to become totally radicalized against men because then the idea that the family is a dangerous place for women makes sense to them. This is their core belief because that is what happened to them as children. Yeah. You know, and instead of being able to recognize that in, in domestic... One of the things that made me compassionate towards my mother and father was knowing their history. And thinking to myself, no wonder she was as she was, because she was absolutely hated by her stepmother and very bad abused. And the same with my father. Interestingly enough, it was his mother, uh, because by the time the 17th child had come along, she had no time for him. And so my feeling is that, that it's, it's extremely important that now, particularly with the situation as it is, with uh, Hillary Clinton now trying to make the Violence Against Women Act to go global, uh, if she gets in, that we really seriously need to, to recruit more people, and particularly men, stand yeah. up and be counted, because it's all very well. As long as they keep their heads down, they'll be fine until by accident they get involved. With... It's, it's too often that people wait till they are personally affected. Like I say, I should have been more critical of these things well before. And, it, you know, I even knew people who had been affected, but it's convenient to just ignore it until it comes for you. But particularly also, you know, men are, from when they're tiny, taught to believe that they're mothers uh, and to put women on pedestals. And it's that's often fathers. You know, I always remember most fathers will say when there's an upset in the family, what did you do, he says to the children, to upset your mother? Yeah. Which is very, very confusing for a child because often the child is completely innocent. It's the mother who has, has wreaked some kind of vengeance on the child. So the child is brought up to think of themselves if they criticize their mother, that somehow it's their fault. Whatever she does. Well, my little girl, excuse me, one of the things that she's been having to do is eat gluten or gluten-free uh, food 
because of all the stuff her mother says is going on. Anyways, long story short, the gluten-free thing doesn't hold any science. Like, I looked into it before I dismissed it. And it's been this whole big thing where she sends a lunch with our daughter whenever I get to see her. It tells her, it tells our daughter, you have to eat what mommy sends you because daddy will give you bad food. Yeah, poison you. And so my daughter just says, I tell, I give her the choice. I don't want her to put her in the middle. No. And she always chooses to eat what the rest of us eat. <laughs> but at the beginning of each visit, she always says, daddy, I have to eat this lunch because I want mommy to be proud of me. Oh, yeah. It's so sad, you know. That... It's terribly sad. And then she already asked, when she goes back, you know that every second she's been with you, she'll get grilled. Yeah. And she knows that. And now she's either going to lie to her mother or tell the truth. And possibly what she does is she'll have, she's already beginning to have to lie. Yeah. yeah. And it's, that's not good. And it's, it, this is another thing that, like I say to her credit, the social worker picked up on and uh, even the child psychologist uh, that my daughter has uh, made mention of it. So it, People are becoming aware. Like you say, I think there is a changing attitude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think there's a whole... See, I'm talking about women of my age group, 75, in their, let's say 60s, that 15 years, or even 55, so let's say that decade. You know, And they were the worst because they were the first, and they were the ones that brainwashed their daughters and had their sons and on down. But there is a whole new generation coming up who are now pro- probably in their 30s and coming up for 40s who, although they've heard all this, have been far enough away from it to stay rational. And so my feeling is, hopefully, as they flood into the, the, you know, into the, the various agencies, that the climate will change, and it'll change for the better, and men and women will be seen for what they really are. And also, I hope, will bring to the whole discussion of how we handle taking care of, of mothers, fathers, and children, to look at generational family violence and the understanding of how if a mother is brought up by, like I was, by a narcissistic exhibitionist, then there are certain things that need to happen for that child so they don't repeat the pattern. Yeah, Change, changing that cycle of uh, a of disturbed fun. family behavior. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And it, can, and it can be changed because that's why in my projects, some of the women stayed in the projects for up to four or five years because the brain is plastic. The brain can always change. The younger you have the child, the easier it is for the child to change. But even much, much later, you can change. and You can change the way your brain thinks and absorbs information. And that's the great hope. I think that's a good spot for us to, okay. to end the interview. I, You know, I really appreciate uh, you coming in and talking to me. Good. Good call. I hope to see you at some point. Anyway, I wish you the very best of luck. And, the, the, and eventually you may well simply have to go for full custody. Well, but, we, we'll, see, I, we'll see We'll yeah. see what she decides to do anyway. Yeah. So does this go out? Was it was it live, or do you have a chance to make changes with it, or what happens? Uh, well, I do edit, but I don't edit for content. I just uh, I take out the spaces and yeah. and I take the background noise if there's any. I take that out. Okay. Uh, and just to give you a warning, mm-hmm. uh, I do sometimes with with your case. I will look for any audio clips that apply to your work sure. that you've done, and I'll put them in certain part. Like you know, uh, every twenty or thirty minutes, I'll set them in for about a minute. Yeah. And there's two reasons I do that. One is when I have a guest, especially like yourself, I try to use it as a, a starting point for my audience to yes. encourage them to look into what you're talking about and to your yeah. work. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of like I'm trying to showcase you not just with the interview, but also with some other stuff. Yeah. And uh, also because I, I personally, being a person who listens to a lot of podcasts, I find that your attention, no matter how interested you are, tends to drift. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so by putting that in there, I think I'm able to keep people focused on what we're talking yeah. about. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. Does yeah. that go on YouTube eventually? Uh, uh, well, I have a site where you can listen to it or download it. Well, that's good. Because what I really desperately need to get to, which is why I do that radio show, is I need men who are absolutely desperate to have places where they can go and listen to the arguments and so they can make up their own mind. Because there's so little for men. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we have a number of topics that we talk about, but this is one where I find there is a lot of people I know are afraid to talk about it. Yeah, sure. And yeah. Uh, I'm not really the back down type of guy, but I wanted to do it in a way that, like I say, your experience brings something to the table that a lot of discussions lack. Yeah. Unfortunately, yes, it, I do. Yeah, but it is getting better. And, you know, I hope if, if, if before I die, we manage to actually demolish the entire structure of the radical feminist patriarch argument. And it is generally accepted 
that it is to a family issue, then I, I feel I'll have achieved something. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, is, is there uh, any, um, uh, anything that you want to point the audience towards? Uh, like I'm going to do, uh, in the show notes, I'm going to put links to any mm -hmm. place you want me to, to send people. Well, but they could have a look at my website. Um, that's, uh, that's erinpitsy.com. Okay. I'll also put a link, like I say, in the show notes. Yeah. And also to the book, uh, This Way to the Revolution, because that really gives you the whole history laid out there. Yeah. I'm going to get myself a copy of that. <laughs> okay, because people don't realize the history. You see, they don't know that it was never a, a women's movement. It was always, as it always has been, you know, it was essentially uh, a Marxist movement, a feminist Marxist movement to create jobs for the girls. And they've been awfully successful if you think about it. Well, probably the only reason I so quickly understood what you're talking about when I heard you make that reference, uh, I think probably on AVFM at some point, was because uh, I had listened to that multi-hour program um, going through and identifying how we are all prone to get involved in ideology until we start identifying the problems with ideology itself. Yes, that's right. Yeah, extraordinary. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Like I say, taking the time. Go ahead, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye. One last thanks to Erin for coming out. That's Erin Pizzi. Uh, you can find her on her own website. Uh, I'm going to put show note uh, links to the different places you can find her. Um, you know, listening back to the interview while I was doing the editing, I have to tell you that halfway through her book, This Way to the Revolution, and Erin has quickly become a hero of mine. Uh, everything in the story, as most people hear, it starts in 1971, but her history goes back further. I think the book is really worth a listen. I highly recommend it, and I highly recommend becoming more familiar with her work and the people that she works with, trying to bring this into focus for the family, rather than blaming someone's gender for all of these types of terrible things that happen to people, particularly to children. Uh, I want to say thank you as well to A Voice for Men for helping me connect to Erin and for continuing to try to work with her to raise people's awareness about the issues she's concerned about. Uh, and in particular, uh, Dean Esme played a vital role there. So I'm going to have those links up for their site, for her site, and about her book in the show notes. I highly recommend it. It's called This Way to the Revolution. You can get it on ebook. And I think most of my audience is savvy enough to find all of that. Check out the show notes again. And I want to thank everyone who listened through the entire thing, who are having the discussions, are honestly wrestling with these ideas. And if you're still trying to, if you're still trying to come up with answers, if you haven't been through this yourself, may I humbly recommend that you talk to someone that you care about and that you trust, who has themselves been through the family courts. And ask them what their observations were, what kind of difficulties they had. That might help inform you from a more personal point of view. And of course, always look into research and data and how it's done before you believe what someone says. Be skeptical. Uh, tune in next time. Our next guest is going to be my friend Terry. Terry Sacre, whose last name I say correctly. <laughs> I'm quite proud. Smashlock will join us for that interview. Till then, peace! Thank you, Mr. Willie. Thank you. You've made my day. Just as a little bonus, for anyone who cares to stick around, I'm going to throw a song on called Mutation. Something I've been working on. In short, it's something that I use modern day superhero movies and television shows to kind of go through the motions of individual change and how it kind of connects with species change. I hope you enjoy it. If not, skip it. It is the key to our evolution. It has enabled us to evolve from a single-celled organism into the dominant species on the planet. This process is slow, normally taking thousands and thousands of years. But every few hundred millennia, evolution leaps.
everything that's inside. So, good becomes great. Bad becomes worse. This is why you were chosen. Because the strong man, who has no power all his life, he lose respect for that power. But a weak man, lose the value. Mutation. 